In this episode of The Christian Philosopher, we're going to talk about why the Shroud of Turin is the fifth reason to think that Christianity is true. Welcome back, everyone. Scott Sullivan here from the Aquinas School of Theology and Philosophy. Today, we are continuing this series, these 10 reasons to think Christianity is true. Today, we're going to talk about the fifth reason. Uh, in previous videos, I talked about not only did Jesus claim to be God, and if he wasn't that, he, would, he was either lying or, or crazy. Not only did he claim that, but he backed it up. He backed it up by fulfilling prophecy. He backed it up by rising from the dead. He also backed it up in the sense that he predicted that his gospel message would never pass away and that his words would just continue. And we have seen that happen throughout history. There was this relatively rapid takeover of the Roman Empire by the Christian religion. No weapons, no armies, it just happened. And now Christianity is, in fact, the largest religion in the world. So his prediction came true. So he backed up his divine claims that way. And we talked about that in previous videos. In this video, I'm going to talk about the fifth reason to think that Christianity is true. I'm talking about the Shroud of Turin. Now, if you don't know what the Shroud of Turin is, it is a 14 foot by 3 foot linen cloth, and it has a very mysterious image on it. It has a mysterious image. It looks like the, the body of the crucified Jesus on it, and we don't know how that image got there. So that's it in a nutshell. Of course, you can, you can Google that. Uh, but you should know that the, all the Gospels say that Jesus was buried in this linen cloth. For example, it says in the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Another example we see in the Gospel of Mark. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. So the point is that Jesus was buried in this linen cloth, according to the Gospels. And actually, the Gospels say he was buried in two linen cloths. He had one over his face and then one that wrapped his whole body. And I'll put the other references, the other Gospel references on my website. But the point is that the Gospels uh, say that he was buried in this cloth. And many people today think that the Shroud of Turin uh, is that cloth. Uh, now, skeptics don't buy that. Uh, skeptics today say that the Shroud of Turin is a medieval forgery, that some dude in the Middle Ages, uh, he was a con artist, and he pulled this big scam over all over everybody. So uh, that's sort of the skeptical uh, position on the cloth, that it's a medieval forgery, and other people like myself think the cloth is legit, that it's authentic. So uh, my view on this is that when you consider all of the evidence, when you consider all the evidence, the medieval forger hypothesis is about as stupid as it gets. And you're going to see why in this video. And I've gone into more length in this video uh, than I have in some of the others in this series on 10 reasons to think Christianity is true because it's, the shroud is just so fascinating. Like you can't do it justice without talking about some of these things. So this video is going to be a little bit longer uh, than the other videos in this series. I just... When I first made this series, I wanted to make it quick and easy. You know, hey, here's 10 reasons to think Christianity is true. But when I got to the shroud, I had to stop and, and, and I almost got lost in it. It was so fascinating. And I, and I, I don't want to, sh uh, you know, shortchange the shroud. So I want to cover all the bases here, so to speak, and kind of give you, I'm still going to give you a summary, um, but still there's so much going on with the shroud that this video is in fact going to be longer than others. So that's what I'm going to do. In this video, I'm going to talk about why we should think that the Shroud of Turin is authentic and why that gives us good reason to think Christianity is true. And my argument, it goes something like this. Premise one, if it's reasonable to think that the Shroud of Turin is the burial shroud of Jesus and that it has a miraculous image on it, then we have good reason to think that Christianity is true. Premise two, it is reasonable to think that the Shroud of Turin is the burial shroud of Jesus and that it has a miraculous image on it. Conclusion, therefore, we have good reason to think that Christianity is true. All right, so that's my argument in a nutshell. Uh, the argument is valid. That is to say, if those premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. And I'm going to defend those premises here uh, in this video. Now, one point before I get started. 
uh, when I when I say the Shroud of Turin is authentic, okay, what I mean by that term authentic, I, I mean two things. Number one, I'm talking about historical authenticity. What I mean here is that uh, the it is reasonable to think that the Shroud of Turin is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus Christ. In other words, this this relic that we have, this archaeological relic that we have, we now call the Shroud of Turin. It's gone by different names over, over history, but this, 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 this cloth that we have called the Shroud of Turin, although it had to be these different names uh, throughout history, nevertheless is identical to the same cloth that wrapped the body of Jesus that we read about in the gospel. So that's what I mean by historical authenticity. And then I also mean the cloth is, has miraculous authenticity. What I mean by that is that given all the current scientific evidence we have about this cloth, cloth, it is reasonable to think that the image on the shroud has no natural cause. Let me say that again. What I'm calling miraculous authenticity, what I mean by that is that it is reasonable to think that the shroud is miraculously authentic, authentic, meaning that the image on the shroud has no natural cause. So by natural cause here, I mean uh, a human didn't make it. It wasn't a medieval con artist, nor was it the product of just, say, natural forces like you know, body vapors or chemicals or anything like that. The, the image on the shroud has no natural cause. Therefore, it has a supernatural cause, and that's why I say it is miraculously authentic. So it's a, it would be an authentic miracle um, in that case. So my argument is that we have good reasons to think that the shroud is authentic in the historical sense, meaning it's the real burial cloth of Jesus. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but the other thing is that the shroud is authentic in a miraculous sense, meaning that there are good reasons to think that that image on the cloth, that image of Jesus, has a supernatural cause. So that's where I'm going with all this. As you see my argument, I'm trying to uh, delineate what I mean by authentic. When I say the shroud is authentic, I mean, I mean those two things. All right, to do this, I'm going to kind of proceed in three steps. Number one, I'm going to talk about the historical authenticity. Then I'll talk about the miraculous authenticity. And then I'll end with a kind of a, a summary of my argument. Now, before I get started, I want to give you a big disclaimer here. The study of the Shroud of Turin, it's called syndonology. It means syndon is the Greek word for the burial cloth used in the gospel. So syndonology, the study of the Shroud, is a huge, huge topic. Okay, If you do a search on, a say, Google Scholar, for the Shroud of Turin, you will get back 13,000, 13,000 academic articles on the Shroud. If you do a search on academia.edu for the Shroud of Turin, you will get back over 5,000 academic articles, okay? So there's a whole lot going on here. I haven't read all those articles, and I know you haven't either. Nobody has, okay? So it's, it's a, there's a lot going on here. So what I'm going to do is kind of give you a summary of what's going on to the best of my knowledge. And uh, that's all anybody, anybody can do. So I'm going to give you the reasons why I think at least the Shroud of Turin is authentic in both senses. All right. Now, one more thing I want to say before I get started, I want to address this idea of the carbon dating, right? The 1988 carbon dating, because if you've heard anything at all about the Shroud, you probably heard it was fake, right? It was proven to be fake by this carbon dating study uh, in 1988. So this is a big deal. It came out. I mean, it made headlines all over the world. It was widely anticipated, the, you know, the results of this study. And it came out that the shroud was made by a medieval forger. They dated the shroud um, with carbon dating somewhere in the area of 1260 to 1390 uh, A.D. So in the minds of many skeptics, the, the case is closed. They're not even going to be open to it, right? The radiocarbon dating proved that the shroud only goes back to uh, the Middle Ages, therefore, case closed, um, we're done. However, you need to know um, that there are many reasons to dispute these findings. I'm going to give you three reasons why we should not trust the results of this one, this one carbon dating uh, experiment. Uh, reason number one is that the shroud contains contaminants on it that can upset an accurate test. The shroud is like a, it's like it's a linen cloth. It's like a coffee filter that's been collecting debris for, I say, 2,000 years. There's all kinds of stuff uh, on there, many contaminants that make it very difficult to study 
with carbon dating. So these contaminants, you know, um, that, that kind of get embedded, you know, in the textile, it can disrupt the whole uh, carbon dating process. And we see this in the, in the uh, scientific literature. So, for example, uh, we have a uh, study here that concluded textiles left alone in normal atmospheric conditions are prone to becoming highly contaminated. The first observations made of the Turin Shroud under an electron microscope by P. L. Baima Bologna and P. Coro Borga and E. Morano in 1978. Sorry if I butchered the names. These tests showed a large amount of contaminating material that does not form part of the original cloth. Another reason why we can't completely trust the uh, carbon dating experiment of 1988 is because of the sampling error. This, this sample that they used, they took it from a corner of the cloth, and other studies have shown, scientific studies have shown, that this corner is likely to be a medieval patch that was sewn on later and kind of woven into the original fabric. Scientific studies have shown that it appears to have a, a kind of a dye on it so that it matches the rest of the shroud. And we see this, again, in the literature. Uh, here is an article that said, Microchemical observations prove that the radiocarbon sample was not part of the original cloth of the Shroud of Turin. The radiocarbon date was thus not valid for determining the true age of the Shroud. And then finally, the third reason why we can't trust the carbon dating test done on the Shroud is that there are strong other reasons, both scientific and historical, for dating the Shroud back much earlier, even to the first century uh, AD. So we're going to look at some of those later. So uh, the idea here, though, is that carbon dating is not the be-all, end-all of age testing. Okay, There are other forms of evidence that have to be considered. We have other scientific studies that show that, that, that the shroud is very old, and also historical records that show that the shroud is very old. We can't just you know dismiss all that and focus only on the carbon dating. Okay, So I say for these reasons, uh, the carbon dating study of 1988 in no way, in no way settled the issue on the shroud. We have to be open to these other reasons. Let's go into some of those now. All right, so let's talk about some reasons why the Shroud of Turin is historically authentic, meaning that that cloth likely goes back to the time of Jesus, somewhere in the first century A.D. Um, in order to do this, we have to show a couple things, that there is an image of Jesus on it, right, and that it goes back to that time period. Um, I'm just going to take it as self-evident, okay, that that's an image of Jesus. I mean, even if you thought it was a counterfeit of Jesus, it's still a picture of Jesus. I mean, you got a guy there with all those same wounds that, that a that we see that Jesus had, you know, during his passion and crucifixion. So uh, that it is a picture of Jesus on there, that's self-evident. All I'm interested in is dating the cloth now uh, when we're talking about historical authenticity. And everybody admits, even, even the most skeptical people admit, that that cloth goes back to at least the Middle Ages, as we, as we saw, you know, in the, in the carbon dating. So we all know, we all admit that the shroud goes back to the Middle Ages. The question is, how much further can it be shown to go back? All right, to start off, let's first talk about some scientific evidence that shows that the shroud dates back to the, the first century. I want to first mention the 2005 vanillin chemical test. The 2005 vanillin chemical test. This is where a 2005 study showed, uh, uh, compared the shroud that we have to other ancient linens that we found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? And they, they measured the rate of loss of vanillin. It's a chemical that comes from, I think it's called lignin, um, that the shroud is made out of this, this plant that has lignin, that over time, I understand that that chemical turns into vanillin, and vanillin is the chemical that we use to make the flavor that we all love, vanilla. And so that you can, you can measure the loss of vanillin over time and compare the shroud to the other linens that we have found that we know that date to the first century because they're amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, if that makes sense. Okay, so this study concluded that the shroud could be anywhere from 1,300 to 3,000 years old due to how the fibers in the shroud have lost their vanillin. We see that there. I'll put the citation for you on the website. I'm not going to quote it, but I'll put it on the website. It's a study uh, by Dr. Raymond Rogers that, that discovered that. So that was the first thing. The second uh, scientific reason is, is another group of Italian scientists in 2015. They used a number of methods to show 
that the shroud dates to the first century. And they concluded that these results give a final date of the Turin Shroud of 90 AD plus or minus 200 years at a 95% confidence level. While this date is both compatible with the time in which Jesus Christ lived in Palestine and with very recent results based on numismatic dating, it is not compatible with the 1988 radiocarbon measurements. And then finally, there was the 2022 X-ray test done by scientists in Italy. Uh, this was a study using X-ray technology to measure the, the degradation rate of textiles over time. And they concluded that the degree of natural aging of the cellulose that constitutes the linen of the investigated sample from the Shroud of Turin, obtained by X-ray analysis, showed that the Turin Shroud fabric is much older than the seven centuries proposed by the 1988 radiocarbon dating. The experimental results are compatible with the hypothesis that the Turin Shroud is a 2,000-year-old relic as supposed by Christian tradition. All right, so the point here, of course, is that we have three independent scientific studies that contradict that radiocarbon study. So according to these new studies, we have good scientific reasons to think that the Shroud of Turin goes back to the time of Jesus, somewhere in the first century AD. In other words, these are scientific reasons to think that the Shroud is historically authentic. All right, so let's look now at some of the historical evidence for the authenticity of the Shroud. I think this is the fun stuff. This, this is just fascinating stuff that we're going to look at, and I just can't emphasize enough. I can't do justice to all of it here. Um, I recommend a book on this, any book by Ian Wilson on the Shroud, very good on this, but the historical record of the Shroud of Turin, I think, is just a fascinating uh, subject to study. So let's look briefly at some of the historical evidence um, supporting the historical authenticity of the Shroud. Now, when we get started with this, I got to kind of, I want to make a, an obvious point, okay? What we call, what we now call the Shroud of Turin wasn't always, it wasn't always called that, okay? What we call the Shroud of Turin, we call it because it's in Turin, Italy, okay? But it wasn't always there. So you might want to just call it the Shroud of Jesus. But the, the Shroud of Turin, or the Shroud of Jesus, as it has existed over the centuries, has gone by different names. Uh, history tells us that what we now call the Shroud of Turin was once called the Shroud of Constantinople. So Constantinople in the round of the year 1000 AD, we're going to see that there was a, a shroud there. And it was before that, prior to that, the Shroud of Turin, I think, was once the what was called the, the Mandilion or the image of Edessa. Okay, Edessa, Turkey, right af from, from the point of when Jesus, right after Jesus died up until around 944 AD, when it, when it came to Constantinople. So, so the point here is that this object that we call the Shroud of Turin, it was once known as the Shroud of Constantinople by historians. Prior to that, this object was once known as either the Mandilion or the Holy Image of Edessa. So Shroud of Turin, uh, Shroud of Constantinople, uh, Holy Image of Edessa slash Mandilion. And then before that, it was just the barrel cloth of Jesus. So there are a number, number of historical documents uh, that show this. If you want a quick summary, again, I recommend any of Ian Wilson's books on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, but there are a lot of historical documents, primary sources, like there's we have a letter of the Emperor Constantine VII. We have this rather, relatively large document called the Narratio de Imagine et Essena, the narration of the image of Edessa. We have uh, what's known as the Sermon of Gregory Referendar Referendarius, uh, we have this older document called the Acts of Thaddeus. There are a lot of these historical documents that when you read them, when you pull them up and, and see what they say, you really do to get a consistent narrative on the Shroud of Turin. So, for example, in 944 A.D., okay, that's kind of the starting point in Constantinople, there was this huge celebration because the holy image of Edessa was now coming to Constantinople it was a big deal and people wrote a lot about it this holy image of Edessa coming into Constantinople at this time it was described as a cloth with the face of Jesus miraculously imprinted on it so we see this in some of the artwork and we see it again in the documents that in 944 in Constantinople this holy image of Edessa came in and it, it was a it had it was a, a cloth it had a miraculous picture 
they said, of Jesus' face on it. And they described this cloth, these historical documents uh, describe this cloth, and they're, they're consistent. These documents are consistent with one another. They say that a first century contemporary of Jesus, a guy by the name of King Abgar, so King Abgar, who, who lived at the same time of Jesus, he got this cloth from perhaps one of the apostles, and it had a miraculous picture of Jesus' face on it. This is how the whole holy image of Edessa uh, gets started. So it comes from Jerusalem to Edessa in Turkey. The king Abgar, he gets it, okay, and it has this image of Jesus on it. And now these documents say in 944 that this image is now coming to uh, Constantinople. And they describe this image of Edessa in a number of interesting ways. They say the image is extremely faint. And one source says it, it's not really, it's not made out of paint. It's like a moist secretion. Uh, it doesn't have any pigment or, or painter's art. It's just like a picture of Jesus without, without paint. Uh, they also say, and this is a Greek word, they also say the image is archeropoetos. In other words, not made by human hands. They also say this cloth wrapped the unoutlined, and the Greek word there is our peril lepton, the unoutlined dead naked body of Jesus, which is a very interesting word. It's an unoutlined image of the body on the shroud. Another eyewitness source said the, says the image wasn't painted, but maybe it was made by the perspiration of death on Jesus' face, you know, so it looks like it may be kind of like made from sweat or dirt or something. They also say the image has a blood stain on the face. So we're talking about this mysterious image of Jesus with a blood stain on it now, not just a painted icon anymore. There's another eyewitness source at the time that says the image has a blood stain on the side. So it's not just a, a small cloth of the, of the face now because it has the side on there. So it's got to be bigger. So there's a blood stains on the face. There's a blood stain on the side. Another eyewitness source says you can not only see the figure of the face, but also the figure of the whole body. So we're not just talking about a face cloth, but somehow it was a whole body cloth as well. On, and several eyewitness sources from this time, they call this cloth a sindon, S-I-N-D-O-N, a sindon. That is significant. They say it's the sindon in which our Lord had been wrapped. Now, this word sindon is extremely important. I don't think it was used by accident here because the word sindon is the Greek word, the exact same Greek word used in the Gospels to describe this burial shroud of Jesus. So we see that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So these, these documents at the time of Constantinople, right? You got this mysterious image of, of Jesus. It's not made by paint. It's faint. It's, not, it's unoutlined. Maybe it was made by sweat or something. They don't really know how it was made. There's blood on the face. There's, a, there's blood on the side. It, it, it's, it's a sin dawn. It's a burial cloth using the exact same word they use in the Gospels, okay? It's clear, I think, they're talking about the Shroud of Turin. So these are, these are verbal written descriptions of the Shroud of Turin that go way back to the year 1000, even 944 in Constantinople. Okay, uh, These are historical documents, in other words, that contradict this idea that the Shroud of Turin only, only goes back to, say, 1300, as it said you know, in, in the carbon, uh, carbon dating study. So... Clearly, I think what we have is, is these, are, these are historical documents that support historical authenticity, at least back that far. Okay, so um, that's like the historical document part of it. Let's talk also about the artwork at that time. So we've got verbal descriptions of the shroud, and then we've got stuff going on in the art world at that time that also kind of tip us off to think, hey, the shroud really did exist at this time. I first want to mention the birth of, of the Thranos or Epitaphios icon genre. So at the same, what I mean here, at the same time these documents are written, we've got the birth of a new style of artwork about Jesus, this new icon genre. Suddenly you start seeing these icons of Jesus laid out on a full uh, burial cloth. This is all within a short period of time when the Edessa icon came to Constantinople. So Right when that happens, suddenly we see this new artwork style where you've got these pictures of Jesus, the, what they call the lamentation art forms that show Jesus being laid out on a large uh, shroud in a way that looks like the shroud. So there, there are a lot of examples of this style of art form. 
So the point being that this new art form was never before seen. It just happens to pop up in Constantinople at this time. At the same time, these documents are describing the shroud. So somehow it seems like these artists are being inspired by some new object and they start making this these icons of a full body shroud. If that's not enough for you, I've got another one, and this is a big one. At, the, at about the same time, we also have what's known as the Prey Codex. This is the single most important piece of art in all of Shroud research, the Prey Codex. It's a medieval Hungarian piece of art. It's been called the final nail in the coffin of the 1988 carbon dating study. Okay, so why? Well, you can look at this artwork, and we see here's an example of you know Jesus being laid out on a cloth. This work can be dated to 1192. So back further than the than the carbon dating study said. It has convinced many researchers that the artist of this piece of work had seen and was inspired by the Shroud of Turin. So it seems like the Shroud of Turin was kind of this authoritative model, you see, again, with, with these different artists at that time, meaning that the Shroud of Turin had to exist at that time, and then, of course, probably earlier as well. Okay, the reason why this Prey Codex is so important is because the similarities between the Prey Codex and the Shroud. So, so for example, we see three, at least three, main points of similarity with the Shroud. Number one, you see Jesus here. He's laid out. It looks like a burial cloth. He's naked. That's unusual. Artists don't typically... Uh, make Jesus naked, but he's naked on the shroud, and he's naked here in, in this cloth. And look at the arms. The arms are folded um, over the pelvis in such a way that the thumbs don't show and the fingers do, and it's, it's kind of a right over left thing. Uh, this is exactly like we see the arms on the shroud. And next we see what's at least a plausible uh, artist depiction of the herringbone weave we see on the shroud. So the shroud of Turin it's woven in kind of a herringbone fashion. Uh, and we see that being depicted, it looks, it looks like, plausibly de being depicted on the Prey Codex. You can see how the kind of, he's got the kind of the, the ziggurat type structure. It looks like he's trying to uh, draw this herringbone weave that he saw on the shroud. And if that's not enough for you, the, 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 the biggest the biggest point, kind of the smoking gun here, similarity between the shroud and the Prey Codex of 1192, is these so-called poker holes. So you see on the actual Shroud of Turin, right by the hands, it looks like the shroud has been burned. They're, they're what they call poker holes, and they're in this uh, distinctive shape. It, it, the, shroud may have, the shroud may have been folded, and, and the, whatever burned it kind of burned all the way through, and it made at least these two spots here. These L-shaped burn holes and these holes are arranged in that kind of a pattern it's kind of like the way a knight moves in chess you know up one and over two these there's these l-shaped uh four burn holes on the shroud right by the hands and you can see those there in the image and these are two sets of holes suggesting that maybe the shroud like i said was folded and then something like incense or whatever dripped and and burned through the shroud but look at this you see the same uh, poker hole L-shaped uh, burn pattern on the Prey Codex. There it is right there. Um, these holes don't really, really have any other artistic value. They're just there, and you got to, like, wonder, what is that? Well, they match the shroud, okay? So it seems like, it seems like the author of the Prey Codex in 1192 had at least seen the shroud. He was trying to, trying to uh, replicate that uh, in his artwork, so the point here is that given these documents and artwork around the time of, say, just as a general ballpark number, 1000 A.D., give or take, okay, around this time period, we see written descriptions of the Shroud of Turin, this, this image, this mysterious image with blood on it, looks like it's made out of sweat, they don't know what it was made out of, uh, miraculous, they would call it, not made by human hands, that was a common phrase. Uh, made of this object the coming from Edessa, this holy image coming into Constantinople. They don't know how it was made. Uh, it contains the image of Jesus. It's a sindon. It's a burial cloth of Jesus. You got all this, this verbal stuff going on at Constantinople in the year 1000 or so. At the same time, you see these changes and this, this new art form of Jesus being on a cloth. And in particular, in particular, this prey codex with doggone it. It's got the, the same burn pattern, the same burn holes, if you will, that the Shroud of Turin has. So we have very good reasons, both the verbal descriptions 
and the different artistic examples, we have very good reasons to think that the Shrine of Turin was once in Constantinople at this time. Now, what all that does is, of course, allow us to date the shroud back to 1944, but we can go further. For example, we have another historical document known as the Acts of Thaddeus. The Acts of Thaddeus, probably written sometime in the 500, let's say. Okay, The Acts of Thaddeus, it talks about, again, some kind of first century King Abgar V, this king in Edessa who lived at the same time of Jesus. Okay, This king in Edessa, Turkey, gets this cloth from Jesus, and it has a miraculous picture on it. So we're, I'm pushing the shroud way back now, 500 more years, back to the 500s, let's say, okay? And this Acts of Thaddeus talks about this image, this image that the king received. It says there was this first central burial cloth of Jesus. It was much larger than just a face towel. Some people want to say it was just a face towel. It was much larger than that. And this Acts of Thaddeus, again, uses that Greek word sindon. It says the cloth was a sindon. Again, the exact same word that the Gospels use, use when they talk about this body cloth of Jesus. The Acts of Thaddeus says, on this cloth is a miraculously printed image of Christ. They call, they call it an archeropoetos. It's something not made by human hands. Okay, so here it is again, a burial cloth with a miraculous picture of Jesus on it. Um, being talked about now in the 500s. So we're pushing it way back. And here's a big kicker because sometimes people want to say, well, the holy image, image of Edessa, that was just a face cloth. Okay, the Acts of Thaddeus says it was more than that. And it calls this burial cloth, a here's an important word, a tetradiplon. Tetradiplon, a Greek word meaning four doubled, folded up four times. Okay, this is extremely interesting. Because here we have a document that can be dated back to the 500s describing the shroud, this burial cloth with a miraculous image of Jesus on it. And, and it calls it a tetradiplon. Why that's important is because a lot of times we see the holy image of Edessa. It's just the face of Jesus. It's kind of laid out in a landscape uh, format. This is an artistic style. And, and it's kind of weird because the face of Jesus is in, Jesus is in the middle and then you've got all this kind of white space on the side. And this Acts of Thaddeus in, in the 500s is calling the, the, this, this uh, image of Edessa a tetradiplon. It's something that's been folded up four times. Very interesting. So when we look at the shroud, as modern scholars have done now, when you look at the shroud and you fold it up four times, get what, guess what you get? You get just the face this way and, and then all the, the white space on the side and you get this same... Uh, landscape format. So we see this, how the holy image of Edessa, this icon genre at that time, and, it, and it's got some of the, you know, the, the, the shape is kind of strange. As I said, it's landscape with a bunch of honestly useless white space on the side. Why did the artist draw it like that? Well, because the holy image of Edessa, according to the Acts of Thaddeus, was a four-folded piece of cloth, a tetradiplon. And when we fold the shroud like that, we get the same uh, sort of layout with Jesus' face just showing. I mean, the shroud's 14 feet long, okay? You can't just drag it around. If you're going to display it in any kind of way, you got to fold it up somehow. Why not fold it up in a way that you can at least see uh, the face? So we see here many, I'll give, you, I'll give you some examples on this video, of how the shroud can be folded one, two, three, four times, and then how that fourth folding, that fourth doubling, if you will, uh, matches the iconography that we see at that time. So this is very interesting. So it's a very interesting hypothesis that, that, that the image of Edessa with the miraculous image of Jesus on it is a four-folded thing. We four-fold the shroud, boom, they match, they match. Uh, and to kind of really test this hypothesis, okay, shroud scholar John Jackson has noted there are on our shroud of Turin what appeared to be Fold marks. There appears to be fold marks on the shroud. I mean, if you fold up a, a linen for a, a thousand years, you're going to have marks, right? Well, these are there appear to be what he calls Mandelian fold marks on the shroud. So when you fold the shroud along these marks, and here's a diagram of, of his study that he did on the fold marks of the shroud, check it out. You fold it up that way, and again, you get an image that looks like the holy image of Edessa or the Mandelian. 
Um, all this, I think, makes a very powerful historical case now that the Shroud of Turin was not only the Shroud of Constantinople, but that object was the holy image of Edessa, and the history documents say goes back to a contemporary of Jesus, a King Abgar V, who received this miraculous cloth. And if all that's not enough for you, I've got one more thing. It's been known as the smoking gun of shroud research. I'm talking about the Sudarium of Oviedo. The Sudarium of Oviedo is known as the other shroud of Jesus. We know for sure that this, this cloth is at least, uh, can be dated back to at least uh, the 600s. So say 614 AD. What the Sudarium is, is, it doesn't have an image on it. It's just a face cloth and it's got blood all over it. So we've got this old face cloth with blood over it uh, that's been dated back to the 600s. Uh, the word sudarium comes from the Latin word, which means like sweat cloth or face cloth. And the Oviedo is the, the place in Spain, the cathedral, it's where the cathedral is, where this cloth has been for a long time. So this, faith, this face cloth of Oviedo, it's been revered for centuries as the cloth of the Lord. Remember when I said in the Gospels, they say Jesus was buried on, with two cloths. He had a body cloth over his whole body, but then he had a face cloth too, okay? This is, I think, the Sudarium of Oviedo, this face cloth of Jesus um, mentioned in the Gospels. All right, so now just like the Shroud of Turin, this Sudarium of Oviedo, this face, face cloth of the Lord, has been the subject of numerous, numerous scientific studies. And here's what we know. Number one, the Sudarium, the face cloth, dates back to at least the 7th century. I think earlier, but... We know for scientifically it's at least the 7th century. Um, the cloth doesn't have any miraculous image on it, okay? But forensic study of this cloth shows us that, number one, the sudarium is covered in real human blood, just like the shroud. Number two, the blood type on the sudarium matches the blood type on the shroud. It's A, B in both cases, okay? Uh, number three, on the face cloth, the man whose face this cloth covered had a beard, mustache, and long hair, just like we see on the shroud. Okay. Number four, the wounds on the sudarium are consistent with the gospel account of the passion and crucifixion of Jesus. So we see wounds on the sudarium, uh, crown of thorns, whips, being beaten, etc. It matches the gospel account, and it matches the, sh the wounds we see on the shroud of Turin too. Okay. Here's a big one. The shape and size of the blood stains on the face cloth match the shape and size of the blood stains on the shroud. All right? Did you catch it? Let me say that again. The shape and size of the blood stains on the Sudarium of Oviedo match the shape and size of the blood stains we see on the shroud. So same blood type, same exact same match in terms of the, the shape of the blood stains. Okay, we know that the, the man... Uh, that the face cloth covered a man who had to have died in upright position, given the way the, the blood you know, formed on the, on, the, on the cloth, just like we know on the shroud. And also, on the sudarium, researchers have found a deposit of dirt right on the tip of, of the nose, an unusual amount of, of calcium and things right here on the, over the, that cover the tip of the nose. We see, that, we see that on the face cloth, and we see it on the shroud too. It's very interesting. So there are a number, a number of points of correspondence between the Sudarium face cloth and the Shroud of Turin. But we know the face cloth dates back to somewhere in the 600s. Therefore, the Shroud had to as well. Because why? Because both cloths had to have covered the same person. The Sudarium and the Shroud covered the head of the same man. Who was that man? Well, who else in history uh, was, was crowned with thorns, beaten, whipped, you know, give me a break. Okay, so both cloths seem to cover covered uh, the, the body of a man who was crucified, just like we read that uh, Jesus was crucified, just like we see in the Gospels. So <clears throat> given the evidence we have from the Sudarium, I think it's absurd to say that, it, that it's, it, these, these cloths cover the head of different people. Okay, that, that, that's absurd. Clearly, uh, these cloths cover the head of the same man, and so, therefore, since the Sudarium dates back to somewhere in the 600s, the Shroud has to as well. All right, so I know that's a lot of stuff. Let's summarize what I've been talking about. Skeptics. Skeptics of the Shroud will say that the radiocarbon dating of the Shroud puts it somewhere in the Middle Ages. 
This, I think, is false, given all the historical evidence that we have. Number one, there have been several scientific experiments that contradict the carbon dating experiment and can date the shroud to the first century. Number two, we have historical documents that show that the holy image of Edessa arrived in Constantinople in 944, and this cloth was unmistakably the shroud. Next, we have historical artwork, most especially that Hungarian prey codex confirms this hypothesis. And then we have this Sudarium of Oviedo, this face cloth of the Lord that had to cover the same person as the shroud did. But we can date the Sudarium back to the 600s. Therefore, we know the shroud is at least that old as well. So I think all of this gives us really good historical reasons to think that the shroud is historically authentic. We can trace it back um, through historical documents back to the time of Jesus. And we've got the artwork and some of the scientific support uh, regarding the Sudarium. So this gives us, I think, a reasonable case. It is, it is reasonable to think that the Shroud of Turin we have today is the burial cloth of Jesus that we read about in the Gospels. All right, so that's the case for historical authenticity. Um, it's very interesting. However, it's not as important, though, uh, when we're talking about the shroud as the case for miraculous authenticity, because actually, you know, if, if the if the image on the shroud doesn't have a natural cause, it doesn't really matter how old the shroud is. It could have been made yesterday for all I care. You know what I mean? So there's a sense in which that uh, the question of miraculous authenticity trumps the question of historical authenticity. But when you want to say, that the shroud was the actual burial cloth of Jesus when you know when he was buried in the tomb. Of course, you you need to go into the history. So, uh, in any case, we've done that the history part. Let's go on now to miraculous authenticity. Um, and when we get into this question, it's important to understand what a miracle is because a lot of people don't really have a good definition of what a miracle is. And if you don't know what a miracle is, you won't recognize one when you see it. Um, so. Uh, a good theological definition of a miracle goes something like this. This is from uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, a miracle is a sensible event done by God outside the order usually observed in things. So we say that a miracle is a sensible event. you got to be able to see it, right, or, or sense it in some way, because if you can't sense it, we, we wouldn't know that it's happening. So uh, the whole point of a miracle for God, from God's point of view is to reveal himself. But if we can't see it, it's not, he's not really revealing himself. So it's a sensible event, something we can see. Um, also, we say uh, it's an event that's outside the order usually observed in things. Since, you know, when we talk about a miracle, we're talking uh, usually about something that goes uh, uh, against the ordinary uh, work of nature, the ordinary course of nature against natural laws, against physical laws, and so on. And then we say that the miracle is something done by God. So what we mean here is that God is not only the agent that causes the miracle, he's the, the efficient cause, as we say, but he's also the final cause in the sense that the reason why uh, God does miracles, the purpose of God doing a miracle, is to show us that he's acting. Okay, so God is trying to reveal himself or maybe authenticate a message by executing a miracle. So <clears throat> that's why we say you got to kind of have those elements. A miracle is a sensible event done by God and then outside the order usually observed in things. So that's, that's what we mean by a miracle. And again, it's important to understand what a miracle is when you're asking, is this thing over here, this Shroud of Turin in this case, is this uh, a miracle? So... Uh, this is how, also, by the way, how we distinguish miracles from just weird events. You know, just frogs falling out of the sky for no reason. No, it's a miracle. It's just a weird event. There's no religious context. There's no connection to God revealing himself. So this idea of this uh, event that, hap that goes against the, the normal course of nature, it's sensible, and it's done by God, meaning that it happens within some sort of religious context. You know, it's not just some kind of weird event that has, that has no explanation. It occurs in a religious context. It's, it's from God's perspective, 
uh, done by him in order to reveal himself. So uh, that's, that, that's important to understand the difference between just weird, unexplained events and miracles per se. All right. So take, for example, to, to kind of authenticate this definition, take, for example, the gospel story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, right, with, with loaves and fishes, right, that, that the miracle we read about in the gospels. Uh, this is a very unusual event, right? They started with just a, a few loaves and fishes, and then they have enough to, to feed everybody. Um, and it occurs in a religious context. You know, Jesus is basically like saying, hey, watch this. You know, that would fit the definition of a miracle that we're talking about here. Okay. So um, th this, this definition of a miracle and, and, and the criteria for it, these are the same criteria we apply to the Shroud of Turin. Okay, here we have, we've got something observable. Boom, there it is. There's a Shroud of Turin. There's the image on the, on the cloth. Um, and then it's got this, this image on it. And of course, <laughs> of course, this cloth is situated in some sort of religious context. It's not just some kind of weird, disconnected event. It's, it, looks like the, it looks like Jesus Christ. It looks like the cloth that Jesus Christ was buried in. So obviously, this phenomenon of, of the shroud occurs in religious context. So um, it, it fits, you know what I mean? It, it fits this, this definition of a miracle. If, if um, it's reasonable to think that, that the, the image on the shroud has no natural cause. So let's get into that right now because uh, that is the main question is what caused this image on the Shroud of Turan? And, and if we give this some serious thought, if after some critical investigation, we can't determine uh, any natural cause for the image on the Shroud, it has no natural cause, right? If you, if you, if you, if you make that investigation and, and you come up with there is no natural cause for it. It is reasonable, given that you've done your due diligence, right? It is reasonable at that point to say, okay, well, then it has a, a, a supernatural cause. There, are, there is no natural cause, therefore it has to have some kind of supernatural cause. It wasn't uncaused. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing here. And if we can do that, we can say, hey, here, here the Shroud of Turin is another uh, miracle done by Jesus, if, if we can do that, okay? So let's go on to that question, and, and I want to kind of give you all that stuff up front to kind of give you an idea of where my head's at and, and, and where I think we need to go when we think um, critically, you know, about, about this issue. So let's, let's look at um, the image on the shroud. Now, when we ask what caused the image on the shroud, okay, there are two images really on the shroud. There is the blood image, right? The, the blood stains on the shroud. And then there is the body image. And we have to consider both. Um, although, technically speaking, it, it's really the body image that would be miraculous. The blood is just blood on the shroud. I mean, the blood we know was just applied. It got there by contact with the body. So there's nothing miraculous per se about the blood image. But um, we do need to consider the blood image because that blood puts a constraint on what natural causes we need to consider when trying to explain the whole thing, if that makes sense. Let me give you an example. So, so some people have thought, well, the shroud is just some sort of proto-photograph, like some, some dude in the Middle Ages, you know, invented photography some what, 500 years before it was actually invented and didn't tell anybody and didn't leave any traces, didn't make any more pictures either, okay? But, but assuming that even, right, the, the proto-photography uh, proto, uh, hypothesis, right, uh, even that wouldn't even explain everything. It wouldn't explain the blood. So even if some dude came up with photography um, 500 years before it ever anyone else did and didn't tell anybody, uh, still this so-called uh, painter hypothesis would have to be coupled with something else. It would have to be coupled with something that would cause the blood stains, right? That this proto photographer, you know, in this case, would have to go out and really murder someone by crucifixion and beat him and put the cloth on him and then and then you know put the picture on there or something, I guess. So um, that's and that's the point. So technically speaking, um, it would be the body image itself that would be miraculous. Um, but still, we consider the blood image because the blood image is it's on there and it needs to be explained, too, because it's just part of it. So um, I want to go into first about the blood image. 
So let's talk about the blood image. The blood image on the shroud is real and medically convincing. Let me say that again. The blood image on the shroud is real and it's medically convincing. Um, and what I mean by that is it is undeniable, undeniable that there is real human blood on the shroud and it's forensically correct. Uh, what I mean is it's not painted on. You can't just paint the blood on. We can, you know, with forensic science nowadays, we can, we can catch that, right? The blood is not painted on and it's not red paint either. It's real blood that was applied by, by contact. Okay. So, uh, the blood on the shroud had to have come from contact with the body. This is what the forensic studies have shown us. And if you don't believe me, go read the literature. Okay. There's plenty of it. Um, and then the stains on the shroud, the blood stains are anatomically perfect in relation to the body image. Okay, so the, the blood flow and so on, it matches the body image. Okay, the stains on the blood stains on the shroud are human blood and they're a type AB. So it's type AB blood, um, which is, by the way, like I said earlier, the same blood that's on the, the face cloth of the Lord, the sudarium. Um, we also know that this blood contains a high concentration of bilirubin, um, which suggests to forensic scientists that the person died from severe trauma. So the blood on the shroud came from someone who had just experienced some severe trauma. Okay. And then whatever it was that made the shroud, there must have been real traumatic injuries going on. And the blood from those injuries got transferred to the shroud by way of contact. All right. And then also, very unlike artwork from that period, so you look at, you t go, go look, go Google medieval um, um, paintings of the crucifixion of Jesus, the passion of Jesus, okay? It's not very realistic, all right? They, these guys were not forensic scientists by any means, okay? It's just like blood squirts and just all these unrealistic directions and, not any way convincing uh, forensically. So unlike artwork from the period, the bloodstains on the shroud are medically convincing in every way. Um, if the shroud, this is why I say that, one of the reasons why I say the, the medieval forger hypothesis is about as stupid as it gets. If the shroud is a medieval forgery, we would expect the blood wounds on the shroud to look like they do in all the other medieval paintings. Uh, but they don't, right? The, the blood stains on the shroud are, are medically convincing. They're forensically correct. Also, also from a microscopic analysis, we know that the blood stain was made on the shroud before the body image. So it's blood first, body image second. We can tell that. There's no, there's no uh, image uh, underneath the blood. The blood goes on first, okay? It'd be very difficult to, for a, a forger to do that, to, to just naturally make the blood by contact and then somehow get the, get the image on there to match, make a match, you know. Um, so those are some of the things about the blood image overall. Let's go into some of the details. Let's talk first about the wrist wounds on the shroud. So when you look at the shroud, the man in the shroud has wrist wounds. There, there's, there's a hole through his wrist, okay? Obviously, this, is a, this would be the nails that... that you know, fasten Jesus' arms to the cross. Uh, the wrist wounds are forensically correct, and they go against all medieval artistic convention. Let me say that again. These wrist wounds on the shroud, they are forensically correct, and they go against all medieval artistic convention. It is highly, highly unlikely that some con man in the Middle Ages, some medieval forger dude, would have made the wounds on the wrist that, like we see them on the shroud. Uh, why? Well, one of the reasons why is because on the shroud, the nail goes through the wrist. Um, in, in medieval artwork, it always goes through the hand, and that's just kind of how they did it. That was the convention. Uh, but uh, putting the, the hole through the wrist, it goes against all uh, medieval artistic convention. But we now know that's forensic, forensically re, uh, correct. Um, scientists have studied with cadavers and nailing them to a cross and putting the, the nail through the hand and it just, it just rips through. Okay, it just rips through. There's not enough flesh in there to, to hold the body weight up. 
But when you put it here, boom, it holds. So we know now um, through testing on cadavers that uh, if you want to crucify someone and nail them to a cross, you got to put the nail through the wrist. Uh, but they didn't paint things like that in the Middle Ages. You know, the, the convention was through the hands. Um, to hold the, so you got to go through the wrist to hold the weight of the human body. So my point is, it's highly unlikely that a medieval forger would do this. It's highly unlikely that a medieval forger uh, who wanted to pull a fast one over on everybody would have put the hole on the wrist instead of the hand like everyone else did. He, there was no reason for him to break med, uh, medieval artistic convention like that. So that's the first thing when it comes to the wrist. Also, when we're talking about the blood, the flow and the amount of blood from those wrist wounds is also realistic. So the, the wrist wounds are significant in the sense because the blood flow and amount of blood coming from the wrist is realistic. So forensic science, of course, didn't exist in the Middle Ages. And we see in the artwork of that time, um, blood flow in, in standard medieval art, it's just, it's just not forensically uh, realistic. But uh, forensic experts when studying the shroud have noticed that the blood is realistically, as it, as it trickles down the arm, out of the forearm, uh, it shows that the man was crucified with his arms out. And also the amount of blood, um, forensic scientists tell us, it tells us that it's actually not a whole lot, which tells us that the heart was not pumping when the nails were removed. Right? If the heart were still pumping when you took the, the nail out, the, the, the heart would pump a lot more blood out. But if you take the nails out from a dead man's wrist, the heart's not pumping, and so just there's less, there's less amount. It's more of a trickle. So these trickles of blood uh, on the top of the forearms is also medically accurate and consistent with those, like I said, with those arms being outstretched. Uh, even with the person being face up on the ground when uh, the nails are removed, because so, the gravity pulls it to the, to the backside, the top of the forearm. And so for these reasons, the wrist wounds on the shroud are incompatible, really, really incompatible with the idea that somehow the shroud is some kind of forgery from the Middle Ages. So uh, the wrist wounds by themselves debunk this stupid uh, medieval forger hypothesis. Uh, the next thing we can look at on the shroud is the, is the, the whip wounds, the flagellation wounds. These, these wounds on the shroud that we see, these wounds from a whip, uh, they're real and they're historically correct. So when you look at the shroud, especially on the back and they're all over the body, but you can see them really clearly on the back. Uh, there are scourge marks all, all over the body. And medical examiners have noticed that these wounds kind of have a dumbbell shape. So it's kind of like a little bit like two round balls on one side and then kind of a skinny part in the middle. And this sort of injury, uh, we now know from archaeology, is consistent with what we know about Roman whips. So there's a, we know from archaeology that the Roman flagrum, so it was the whip, is a wooden handle and had certain number of leather straps and on those straps on the end of those straps they would put various kinds of spikes or, or weights they had obviously different kinds but a common roman flagrum uh, had these leather thongs with dumbbell shaped weights uh, attached to the ends and it's just highly unlikely that a medieval painter would know these details you don't see that in any other medieval painting you don't see that kind of forensically correct dumbbell shaped wound on any other painting from the Middle Ages. Also, the spear wound on the side. Uh, there's a spear wound on the shroud, just like the gospel say, you know, Jesus was stabbed with a Roman spear. Uh, the spear on the side is realistic, and it actually even matches the known size of a Roman spear. Um, the blood flow coming from the spear wound, it's been recognized as forensically correct. It's got real blood clotting patterns. Modern UV light has revealed also blood serum uh, coming out of the wound, it's kind of dried on the shroud around the wound, which we would expect from a real wound and impossible for a medieval forger, I think, to fake this. Um, so on the right side of the chest, it says there's, there's a large stain of blood and serum, uh, which is a consequence of sudden death by rupture of the heart wall. This is a relatively recent discovery of medicine, uh, unlikely that a, that a medieval painter uh, would know that and be able to pull that off. So... Again, this is unlike anything else from the artwork of the Middle Ages. Medieval artists, they didn't know how to do this. They didn't know how to realistically represent blood flow. You can see this easily. Again, Google some paintings you can see, um, let alone create things like blood serum on their paintings and stuff. They just didn't do that. So um, 
the stuff that we see on the shroud wouldn't be discovered for another 600 years. Also, we can look at the wounds from the crown of thorns. They are also forensically correct, and they too go against medieval artistic convention. The artistic convention in the Middle Ages, they, they would paint a crown of thorns. You look at any painting in, in the Middle Ages, and Jesus has a crown of thorns, and it, it's, a, it's a circle. It's a circle around the head. That was the artistic convention. Um, but unlike that, unlike these medieval pay, uh, paintings, there are on the shroud, the man on the shroud, there are puncture wounds, big puncture wounds all over the head. It wasn't a circle crown. It was more like a big, nasty bush. And you should, some of those thorn bushes in the, in the Palestine area are pretty wicked, and long spikes on them. But it looks like someone took a bush, a thorn bush, and just crammed it on his head because the, the, the punctures go all over the head. Um, and so the wounds we see on the shroud, again, are not consistent with medieval artistic convention. It's unlikely that, that this, this so-called con, con man would just start breaking all these artistic conventions in the Middle Ages and get them all forensically correct, too. Um, so again, unlike the blood flow of medieval art, the blood flow from the shroud, from the crown of thorns, is uh, for irregular, and it's also forensically correct. So... For these reasons, it's absurd to think that the blood on the shroud was caused by some medieval forger. So that's why I said I wanted to talk about the blood image because it rules out a lot of hypotheses. It, the blood image itself rules out the idea that somehow some medieval con man made the image on the shroud. Um, so the blood tells us a lot. So some of the things the blood tells us is number one, these are the wounds of Jesus, right? It, it's, it's, the, it's the blood wounds that really tip it off, that this, this man was crucified, just like we see Jesus was crucified in the gospel, the same passion, same crucifixion, the nails in the hands, the spear wound, the whips, the, the crown of thorns, all that stuff. Um, it, strains credul it really does strain credulity to think that it's an image of anyone else. I mean, like I said, even if it's a counterfeit, it's a counterfeit of Jesus, you know what I mean? So there is no one else in history who, who uh, was said to suffer that kind of death and torture and, and so on. So um, it, it, the, 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 it's the wounds in the shroud that really tip us off that th this is Jesus Christ here. Also on the shroud, like I said, the blood image is real. It's medically convincing. It's real wounds, real blood, really uh, made by contact. Therefore, a real death was involved. Um, whatever it was that made the image, whoever it was that made the image, if you think it's a, if a, a forger, there was a real death involved. Someone really had to die to make the shroud, to get that blood image on there. Um, the spear wound with the serum, you know, that that's, comes from someone dead. Um, so you remember that. that the, anytime someone says the medieval forger made that, someone had to be really tortured and killed to make the shroud. So if, if some painter guy made it which you know it's not paint but you know what i'm saying if some painter made it first he had to go kill someone reenact the, the the passion and crucifixion of jesus get the blood on there and then you know somehow paint around it you know so it just it's just absurd uh also this the blood image also tells us the overall image can't be just a painting or a photograph right you have to account for the blood it's not enough to say that it's a charcoal or a rubbing or a painting or anything, or you know, anything like pencil. It's, and, and, and you have to account for the blood too. Um, so that limits your choices of explanations. You got to add some more things in there. And then, as I've been kind of saying all along, of course, the blood in the shroud is important because it makes the medieval forger hypothesis ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Okay, just just from the blood image alone, we can just knock out. I think the medieval forger hypothesis. All right, so now let's talk about the body image on the shroud. And the first important point I really want to stress is the body image was not made by any known artistic medium. Okay, it's not a painting, it's not a pencil, it's not a charcoal, it's not a rubbing, um, it's not a crayons, it's not a photograph, not brushwork, not a scorch, not a, not a scorch, uh, not anything like that, not uh, uh, markers. <laughs> it's not any of those things. Um, every artistic possibility has been tested, scientifically tested. It's not any of these things, okay? If the image were a forgery, especially a medieval forgery, uh, 
we would find something, right? It, it, we would expect to scientifically detect some kind of art medium on there. We can't do it. So to say that the shroud is a piece of art, human art, is unscientific because there is no detectable uh, artistic medium on there, okay? Uh, there is no such medium. So I think it's highly implausible, if not just say impossible, that somehow a medieval forger would create an image like this with some kind of medium that would not be detectable by, by modern science. That's just stupid. Okay, that's the first thing I want to say about the body image. It's not made by any known art medium. Um, the second thing is, is the body image is extremely superficial. It's very thin, okay? This is kind of a, another unique part of the body image. This is the baffle scientist. It's extremely exceedingly superficial uh, imposed on the cloth, okay? It's so thin it has to be measured in nanometers. And if you don't know what a nanometer is, I had to look it up. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter, okay? One nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And if you take a normal sheet of paper, and you turn it sideways, and the thickness of the paper is about 100,000 nanometers. So the, a paper thickness is about 100,000 nanometers, the shroud is 200 to 500 nanometers. So paper, <laughs> 100,000 nanometers. The shroud image, 200 to 500 nanometers. Much, much thinner, much thinner than a piece of paper. And because of this, there's nothing soaked into the fibers on the shroud. Like if you put paint or ink, it would, it would ooze into the fibers and stuff. Uh, but there's not anything like that on the shroud, right? The blood soaks into the fibers, but the image doesn't. So that means there's no dye, there's no ink, there's no chemicals. It's not a result of body vapors, like, you know, coming up from the body and, you know, those, those vapors would penetrate some of the, the fibers and it would color deeper into the shroud, so to speak. There's nothing like that. <clears throat> um, so even if a natural art medium were used, it would be difficult to explain this 200 to 500 nanometer thin uh, image we see on the shroud. So it's highly implausible, in other words, that a, a medieval forge would be able to pull this off. Uh, the next point, and this is huge, and I love this point because anybody can recognize it. You don't need a microscope or anything. One incredible and underappreciated fact about the shroud is that it is best seen as a photographic negative. You know, for, for centuries, uh, nobody got to see the shroud as it really is because... It's not until you take a photograph of the shroud, the normal, it's normal, like a sepia colored, it's, the image is very faint. It's very faint. Hard to see normally, but with the naked eye. But it wasn't until the, the invention of photography when you took a picture of the shroud and then with that picture of boom, you flip it over into a negative. Bam, then the shroud comes alive. So it's, it is as if whatever it was that made the shroud made it for our modern age, at least after the age of photography, because you couldn't see that stuff until then. Um, it wasn't even possible to see something as a photo negative until the 19th century. So, you know, if you take my history argument earlier, we've got 1,900 years of nobody really seeing the shroud for what it is. It wasn't until you could make a negative of it that you could really see it. That, to me, is fascinating um, and uh, how do you explain that? It, whoever it was, whatever it was that made the shroud, it's no exaggeration to say that the details of that image would not be seen for centuries. I think it's huge. I, I think that, that by itself makes the medieval forger hypothesis ridiculous. How could a medieval forger do this? Make something in a negative that nobody would see? Why, why would he do it, you know? Um, this is why, this, this point is why some skeptics have tried to wonder, well, maybe there was a, some guy in the Middle Ages and maybe he invented photography, you know, no uh, recorded precedents, uh, precedent up to it, you know, no, no indication that it was going on and no indication afterwards. And he made one photograph, this photograph of Jesus, so to speak, and then didn't make any more, you know, um, then photography would died again, had to be rediscovered, you know, centuries later. 
<laughs> so I think, again, that this idea, that this, this evident fact, do it for yourself. Go, go online, download a high-resolution image of, of the shroud. Normally, it's sepia-colored with a very faint image on it. Put it up on your computer. Pull it up in some kind of Photoshop or some kind of photo program. Flip it over to negative. Boom! Right? It's not being faked here. You can do it yourself. The image will come alive when you flip it over to a negative. And you're doing something, you're seeing something that nobody else could for 1,900 years. Pretty amazing. Uh, certainly there's no way a medieval forger would do this, right? Okay, and if that weren't enough, let's talk about another aspect of the image on the shroud. This scientifically demonstrated fact about the image is that the image on the shroud contains 3D information. <laughs> 3D information. So we have this, um, this device called a VP8 image analyzer, and they can use it to measure the topography of planets. It, it converts uh, the density of an image over into vertical uh, dimensions, and, and it, it, it can bring three... If, 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 uh, they can look at a planet and pull the, the topography out of a planet. Um, but the thing is, is you can't fake this. So when you, if, you apply, if you apply it to... If you apply the VP8 to a normal picture or a normal, a normal photograph, you just get static and distortion. Okay, it's got to be applied to a real thing with real dimension, so to speak. <laughs> but when it was applied to the, to the shroud, um, the researchers that did this were astonished because when they applied the VP8 to the shroud, boom, you got an accurate uh, 3D image out of that data. So no other photograph, no other painting, no other picture can do this. It's just the shroud. Um, we don't know how. I mean, we can't do this now. We can't make an image like this now. So somehow, whatever it was that made the shroud, encoded it with 3D information that, be, that could be measured by uh, a scientific device uh, that didn't exist until the 1970s. Right? So how, would, how do you explain that when it comes to the medieval forger hypothesis? Uh, it's impossible. It would be impossible for a medieval forger to create a painting or whatever you want to say he did and then have it encoded with 3D information that wouldn't be detectable until, you know, what, 500 or so years later, 400 years, whatever it was, okay? And, and it wouldn't be detectable until the, the VP8 was discovered. Absurd. So it's impossible for a medieval forger to do this. All right, the next aspect I want to talk about on the shroud that defies natural explanation, if you will, is what is known as double superficiality. Double superficiality. It's also known as the shroud's second image. Um, we know that the shroud was damaged in a fire back in 1532. And so in response to that, a group of nuns got to, together and they, they wanted to repair the shroud. And one of the things they did was they sewed a backing onto the shroud. So you had the original shroud, it was damaged in a fire, and they kind of put a, a back, they sewed a backing on the shroud for support. And that was back in the 1530s. And then what happened was, as a result of that, nobody saw the back of the shroud for about 500 years or more, more than 500 years. Um, so we didn't know what was back there. You could only see the front. And then in 2002, uh, the backing was taken off because they were doing another restorative project on the shroud. So they decided in 2002 to take this uh, backing that the nuns had sewed on, they're going to they're carefully take it off in order to, to try to make the shroud restore it in a different way, in a modern way. And, for the, and so for the first time in history, in 2002, they took pictures of the backside of the shroud. So if Jesus' face was on the front of the shroud, they took pictures of the backside here. And what they, were, what they found out was, for the first time, scientists saw a new, second, and very even more faint image on the now exposed backside of the shroud. So there's a... There's the face image on, on this front side, but now there's also a, a duplicate of that image on the back side. It was first seen in 2002. Um, this image of the face was directly behind the more familiar front image, and both sides, both facial images are very superficial. They're very thin, like I said. They, 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 don't, they don't penetrate the cloth. It's just the outermost 200 to 500 nanometers deep thing. But, but there's nothing in the middle. 
Okay, so let me, here's the shroud. I'm going to turn the shroud sideways. So now you're seeing the side of the cloth. There's the original facial image on the, what we call the front that was on Jesus' face. It doesn't penetrate the, the thickness of the cloth. And now we know there's, there's a second image on the uh, back side of the cloth, and there's nothing in the middle. Superficial face, superficial face, nothing in the middle. They match. The faces match up. Um, we don't know how to explain this. The image of the face on the front of the cloth and on the back of the cloth, not in the middle. So, it's, again, it's not body vapors, you know, like vapors coming up from the body that, that would seep in and discolor some of the uh, more interior parts of the cloth and so on. <clears throat> it's not any of that. And this double image, this double superficiality image, um, is another feature that has to be taken into account when you want to know what caused this image. Whatever was the cause that made two of them on the front side and the back side. Um, it means the, <laughs> we don't just have one mysterious image. We have two. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to say about that. It would be exceedingly difficult to fake this. What are you going to do? So, All right. <clears throat> so I gave you some of these, I, these things that are extremely hard to explain. These are scientific facts about the image on the shroud. So now we have to ask, all right, well, this is the, this is the all-important question. It's time for the all-important question. What caused the image? Anybody want to take a swing? Uh, the scientific answer is simply this. Nobody knows. We don't know what caused the image on the shroud. <clears throat> what, we, what we do know is what I've been telling you is that the shroud is the most scientifically tested archaeological object in the history of the world. Let me say that again. The Shroud of Turin is the most scientifically tested archaeological object in the history of mankind, and we still have no idea what made it. We have no idea what made the image on the Shroud. In spite of all of our modern technology, can't tell. Okay. Not only that, what would be a corollary from that, I guess, is we can't make one now. Anybody who thinks that a medieval forger made it could should be able to do it themselves. If a guy in the Middle Ages can do it, with our technology, we should be able to do it too, but we can't. All right. And so far, to date, there have been a lot of attempts, right, to reproduce the image. But so far, to this day, every single attempt to reproduce the body image, having the, having the same qualities, the microscopic qualities. Sure, sure you can draw a picture uh, and make it look like the shroud. You could do a lot of things, but that's not what we're talking about. It has to, to meet all the, the microscopic criteria, if you will, right? Having the same uh, microscopic and even some of the, ma the macroscopic qualities. Uh, to, to repro every single attempt to reproduce that has failed, totally failed. Um, there's a well-known scientist, Dr. Paolo Di Lazaro, who's done a lot of work on the shroud. Uh, he says the same thing. He says, up to date, all attempts to reproduce an image with the same microscopic and macroscopic aspect, as well as all the chemical and physical characteristics, have been unsuccessful. In this respect, the origin of the body image is still unknown. All right, so why would he say this? Why would Dr. De Lazaro say this? Well, the answer is quite obvious, as we've been saying. There's no known natural explanation for this. We have no known natural cause that, that could that could satisfy all the stuff that we see on the shroud so we've talked about a lot of things let me kind of put the problem in perspective for you with all the the different the, the blood stuff and the body image stuff okay any successful theory of image formation when it comes to the image we see on the shroud of turin any successful theory uh, would have to account for all of these characteristics so if you want to come up with a hypothesis on what caused the image on the shroud. We would have to account for all these things that we know through uh, scientific investigation, okay? First thing you'd have to do is create the blood image because we said blood, blood, the blood was on there first and the image came second. So the blood would have to go on first. So the blood on the shroud, like we said, it's, not, it's real, it's not painted on, it's all forensically correct, unlike all those evil, other medieval pieces of art. The blood on the shroud was like it was before the body and was applied by real contact. 
The blood in the shroud contains high amounts of bilirubin, as we said, which is indicative of trauma. Uh, the blood on the shroud from, uh, uh, from the scourge marks matches the Roman flagrum, unlike all other medieval works of art. The blood on the shroud from the spear wound indicates someone really had to die to make this image. And the blood on the shroud matches, as we've been saying, the wounds of, of Jesus' crucifixion that we read about in the Gospels. So, if you're going to fake the shroud, the first thing you got to do is get the blood on there. And it's got to be real blood, and it's got to come from some sort of passion slash crucifixion like Jesus went through. So, you're going to have to find somebody, some male victim, right? Tie them up, whip them, place that crown of thorns on their head, nail them to a cross, um, stab them in the side with a spear, kill them, bring them down, boom, put the cloth on there. Now you got your now you got your blood image. You had you had to really torture and kill a guy, just like Jesus Jesus was tortured and killed, just to get the blood image on the shroud. Okay, but even then you're not done, because, like I said, um, in the history section, we know the blood on the shroud matches the blood uh, we see on the Sudarium of Oviedo, that that face cloth of the Lord too. So you got to make sure that when you make this blood image, you got to make sure that your blood stains match those blood stains. Make sure you get the blood type right, too. And don't forget that little dirt on the piece of the nose, because that, that's on the, the sidereum too. Um, impossible for, for a medieval forger to do. But let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that a forger did this. He went ahead and crucified someone. He's really, he's a committed guy. I mean, he wants to pull off a good, uh, a really good uh, fraud on everybody. So he's, he's committed. He's so committed, he's going to go do the, the crucifixion thing on somebody. And he pulls that off. Um, but now it gets even, he, he's faced with a more difficult task. Um, because he, now he has to make the image, the body image. Okay. The body image contains no artistic mediums, no paint, no ink, no charcoal, no charcoal, no human works of art, no pencil, no crayon, no scorch. How are you gonna make the body image? Uh, the body image is also anatomically correct. Unlike those medieval works of art. Uh, the body image is, like I said, superficial, extremely superficial and thin, 200 to 500 nanometers deep. Um, so you can't make it through chemicals or vapors. The body image on the front is duplicated on the backside of the cloth. Remember that, double, remember that double superficiality thing. Nothing in the middle. Good luck with that, Mr. Forger. Uh, the body image is a photographic negative, but, 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 but photography didn't exist until the 19th century, so you can't use photography to make the image. But it's got to be a negative, too. Oh, and don't forget, the image contains 3D information. So make sure that somehow, even though no other painting, no other picture in the world has this, you've got to get the 3D information in that image somehow. somehow. And so this body image is, is just unique. There's nothing else like it in the world. It cannot be replicated today because of these reasons. In spite of all, all of our modern science, in spite of, in spite of all of our modern technology, there is nothing in the world like the Shroud of Turin. So here's what we know. They've got this cloth. It's got this strange image of Jesus on it. It can be historically traced to the time of Christ. We have no idea what formed this image. We have no idea. We've never seen anything like this. Nothing else like it exists in the world. We can't re reproduce anything like it with our modern technology. If it's a hoax, there's nobody in the world right now that can duplicate that hoax. Uh, and if you still don't agree with me after all this, some of you skeptics out there that want to send me emails, if you still don't agree with me, maybe you just want to bite the bullet. Right? Ah, somehow some medieval forger did it. Okay, fine. If you think it's fake, prove it, and you can win a million dollars. Right? Uh, producer David Rolf has offered the British Museum one million dollars if they can replicate the shroud. Now, the British Museum, they have a lot of resources. They have scientists and researchers. they got a lot of money, okay? He says, David Rolfe says, what I said, that if a medieval con man did it, then someone there should be able to do it too. So for all of you skeptics out there who, you know, don't buy what I've said, if you think it's fake, go for it. Hey, maybe you can make one like, uh, just like it and win a million dollars. But just a little fair word of warning, uh, so far nobody's ever taken David Rolfe up on his offer. 
All right, so let's wrap this up. I want to summarize my argument. This was a lot of stuff we talked about. And again, I told you I wanted to go into a lot of detail on this because it's just fascinating. I mean, I had to stop and pull myself off because I wanted to get this done. But I haven't even, there's, there's more to talk about here, but I've got to wrap it up. So let's summarize my argument this way. Premise one, if it is reasonable to think that the Shroud of Turin is the burial shroud of Jesus and that it has a miraculous image on it, then we have good reason to think that Christianity is true. Premise two, it is reasonable to think that the Shroud of Turin is the burial cloth of Jesus and that it has a miraculous image on it. Therefore, conclusion, we have good reason to think that Christianity is true. Now, this is a valid argument. This is the way logic works. If, if you have a valid argument, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. This is a valid argument, meaning if those two premises are true, then the conclusion is true. And I think it's pretty clear that the first premise is true, right? Um, we've been looking at that for a long time. If we have good reason to think that the shroud is historically authentic, it really is the burial cloth of Jesus, and we have good reason to think that it has no natural cause, right? Then we have, it has a miraculous image on it, in other words. We have good reason to think that Christianity is true. I mean, boom, there it is, right? Another miracle from Jesus. And premise two is what we've been arguing all along. It is reasonable to think that that piece of cloth dates back to the time of Jesus, it's got his picture on it, and that picture slash image, whatever you want to call it, has no natural cause. Okay, we've done our due diligence here. Um, we trace it historically, you know, from, from, the, from the Shroud of Turin to the Shroud of Constantinople to the Holy Image of Edessa back to the, 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 the biblical Gospels accounts, accounts of the, of the, the cloth. This, this historical conclusion we talked about is corroborated by some of the scientific evidence, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, test of the vanillin, x-ray test of the fibers and so on that dated to the first century. That's some of the support for the historical authenticity that I was talking about. And then given the, the image itself, as we've been saying, the nature of the blood image, the body image on the shroud, it is absurd and maybe one of the most stupid things people could say that a, that a medieval forger did that. Um, and going beyond that, it is reasonable to think that it is not the product of any human artwork or any natural cause whatsoever, given that we can't even recreate this image today in spite of all of our modern technology. So given all that, uh, there is no known natural cause here. All of this fits that definition of a miracle that I talked about. And all of this gives us yet another reason to think that Christianity is true. Hey guys, just real quickly, if you like this stuff and you want to learn more about what I teach, you can check out my website, scottmsullivan.com, and there I have a free trial into the Aquinas School of Theology and Philosophy. There you can take full courses in theology, philosophy, apologetics, uh, logic. You can take tests and test your knowledge and earn certificates. A lot of stuff going on there. Uh, and again, like I said, you can get a free trial at my website, scottmsullivan.com.